You're listening to the Women Talking About Learning podcast. My name is Andrew Jacobs. Welcome. Hello everyone and welcome to this episode, the Disruption One of the Women Talking About Learning podcast. What's great about the podcast is all I do is off up the topics and the speakers interpret the topic in their own way. And this week is a classic example of that. This week our guests are Serena gonsalves Fersh and Dr. Elenia Salatja. Serena is the head of Software One's Talent Academy. This is an initiative focusing on developing and employing the next generation of talent across the world whilst giving back in education and opportunities to local communities. She's a fellow of the LPI and currently also a doctoral candidate at Middlesex University, researching into the future of learning and the RD function in technology accelerating organisations. Elena is a learning architect and mission driven entrepreneur. She founded the company By Design Development Solutions, helping authors and entrepreneurs translate their unique subject matter expertise into consumer learning products. With over 12 years in experience in teaching, instructional design and program management, and in educational evaluation, Elena has worked in a number of sectors. These include higher education, finance, victim services, real estate, healthcare, and software development. As I mentioned, we're here to run of recording episodes that were simply brilliant, and this one again is fabulous. We were recording and a thunderstorm hit, so you might hear the internet fade in and out a little bit, and if you hear a tapping sound, it's the noise of rain hitting Serena's roof. This is Women Talking About Learning. This is Serena and Elena talking about disruption. I'm Serena and I am the head of a talent management at Software One's Academy. Uh, I have been in L&D for 20 years um, after a master's in HR, so it's pretty much the only field I know. Around four years ago, I looked around me and realized that whatever we were doing in learning didn't work or didn't feel sustainable. I would go for all these conferences and these learning technology events and every last, it felt like the future of the world was technology and and digital and therefore the future of learning was technology and every new piece of kit was the next silver bullet to solve all our problems. Something felt very clearly wrong. You also then asked people in learning, um, how do adults learn? You know, how, how, what do they, how do they develop in their careers and their organizations? And no two L&D people gave you the same answer. Uh, so I took all of this and I looked around me at where I was in the space and I was in consulting and in technology, both client facing and then as a functional head and said, uh, either I want to fix this from the inside or acknowledge through study that our function is doomed to not exist in the future. Um, And that's how the doctorate came about. So over the last three years and some, I have been researching into what L&D would look like um, in in the future in uh, firms in hyper growth, in startups, uh, and in those going through incredible change, mainly driven through technology transforming their industry. Elena. That's a fantastic background. I'm so excited to be here with you today. Um, I also think it's interesting um, because listeners are joining us from all over the place and we come from different places Um, and I don't know you and you don't know me. So um, I'd love to learn where in the world are you from and I can share with our listeners where I'm from and then we can dive into our academic backgrounds because I know we're gonna geek out on this disruption conversation today. I can already tell. Awesome. So, uh, yes, Serena Gonsalves Fiash. I am from India. The Gonsalves is the the, the Portuguese background, mm. originally mm. from Goa. The Fiash is my German husband, uh, and I am based out of London. 
Wow, fantastic. Um, well, I am Polish, so I'm Elena Schlachta, Dr. Elena Schlachta, and I, um, my background is uh, my family comes from Poland, and um, we have been, I'm third generation here in the United States. Um, I know our listeners will have fun listening to both of our accents. They probably won't have any difficulty telling us apart, um, but yeah, I, I am in Austin, Texas, and I have the pleasure of also being a consultant and working for myself, and so I get to travel and I am currently traveling and seeing family in Michigan and I'm on my way to Montana next week. So um, I get to bebop around. Um, but yeah, glad to be here today for our conversation. Likewise, and lucky you can actually travel. We're, uh, we, as of today, so, so can we. We can finally leave London or well, leave anywhere. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. I, I, this, the last year, speaking of disruption, I think the last year has um, really shown us a lot about the future. And I'm, I want to dive into that with you. Um, and you've shared with everyone, um, you know, your background and what got you into learning and development. And I just want to share with people a little bit about my background, because I think we come from different perspectives, and yet I think clearly have a similar passion. Um, so I have a doctorate degree in human sexuality education. And um, it was one of those things where I went to my very first undergraduate background. I got a marketing degree. I got a job at a college and I was like, this is just not that interesting. <laughs> and I always wanted to get a doctorate degree, um, partly in vanity and partly because I love learning. And I thought to myself, like, what could I learn about that would sustain me for the rest of my life because you know you invest in a district you know the time in your dissertation and the years and the money and just all the brain extensive expansion that you do um I had to figure out what's that topic that I could you know fall in love with and and be an influencer in. and so for me it was sexual health I felt like in our country in the United States our sexual health education was really lacking um and that's what brought me to the, the doctorate degree in the first place but that's not what I ended up doing Doing. Um, after being out of school for five years, I, I ultimately did a career journey where I've been in literally all the different higher um, adult learning markets, starting with higher education. I was a professor teaching sociology, um, human sexuality, and research methods. And I love teaching, but kind of what you mentioned, it didn't quite feel like it was a model that was sustainable. I really feel like higher education and then the, the track in a career for being a professor, it just felt, it really felt old and outdated and it felt too rigid. And I don't believe learning should be rigid and now, nor should the experience for either the professor or the student. And so I left higher education after a couple of years um, went into the world of nonprofit training, spent three years doing domestic violence training and education, and I really um, learned a lot about trauma. And so really, you know, deepened my understanding of human psychology as it relates to teaching and training and counseling, and then left that space and went into corporate, which was like completely different experience of learning. Um, and I felt like every time, every adult learning space that I was in was very rigid in its own kind of way. And that's really what led me to go out on my own as a consultant, because I just believed that the way that people were understanding learning and how we were using learning as a tool was just so in the original industrial revolution idea of learning. And we are just no longer there anymore. We are in a, a technological AI, just completely different style of learning with the tools we have accessible and so anyway, I know the two of us will dive into what should we be doing and thinking about and what does disruption look like? Um, but I just wanted everyone to know sort of the human sexuality and the human psychology background that I'll be bringing to our conversation today. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. What a diverse, <laughs> completely mixed journey. Um, yes. you, you mentioned something and of course it's, you know, we, we, we can't talk about uh, disruption without talking about the past year, right? So how about we start <laughs> there and um, yeah. tell me, I, I think in many ways, the last year and a half has uh, made a business case for change in learning mm -hmm. more than ever before. But sure. I think also that when all this ends, it's not as strong a disruption as people think it will be. 
Yes. Um, oh my gosh. As I, was, <laughs> I was like, yes. Um, as I was thinking about what we could talk about today, I, I kind of was seeing a, there's a revolution going on. And I think what happened is that COVID sparked the revolution, like K through 12 education systems on their head, higher education systems, everyone was forced to do things differently. But what's really interesting is that I think we've gone sort of into your territory about the technological opportunities that we can incorporate into learning. But in my perspective, what I've observed and what I've been reflecting on is that we're just using the technology tools in the same ways that we've always done learning, which is producing the same limited results. And that to me is really frustrating. Um, I hear a lot of words about like transformation and that um, people are using learning, but they're not talking about actual learning. They're talking about information sharing and content sharing and that's not learning. And so it's just kind of mixed up now with really cool technology that can do a lot of amazing things. And when designed properly, oh my gosh, the opportunities of what we can really do are amazing and limitless. But I see a lot of this going back and, and using old ways of thinking with new technology and it's just not working as well as it could be. Somewhere down the line, learning became equal to content. Yes. It was like the more stuff you had, yes. the yes. more somebody was going to learn. So yes. it became that the role of an L&D person was purchasing these huge content libraries mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. throwing them at people and mm -hmm. figuring, you know, now you've got all of this stuff, go forth and learn. And somehow I, I it just, it makes no sense and what I thought would happen during the pandemic. So yes, it did make a case to show that we don't always need the classroom, that we can right. think collaboratively, we can right. think of virtual learning and online models, but not when you take those hours of content that you have and then just move them onto a digital source with little yeah. to no thought behind it, including yes. whether a person can absorb the same way as right. they do or physically. Um, yeah. uh, one more one more thing before I hand it back to you is that everybody um, says things like we have now established a case for virtual and online learning and this is the future and l and will never go back. And mm -hmm. I disagree because mm -hmm. if I ask you or anyone, what are the top three things you will do when all of this is over? And you'll say, and sorry, I'm going to paraphrase you, we, we'll say travel. We all mm -hmm. want to travel. Mm -hmm. I want to mm -hmm. go and hug people I know or go to offices and shake hands with people I still never managed to meet because I joined during mm -hmm. the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I want to share a meal I, with somebody. I want to sit outside and have a conversation and I mm -hmm. want to network. So if mm -hmm. these three things are what we want to do as humans. Why would we think that the people in our organization would want to continue online from a learning experience? They will mm -hmm. want to travel. They will want to be in networking in a room again. And they mm -hmm. will want that physical contact with people who they've only got to see over, over a screen. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that if we believe that the pandemic has irreversibly changed and moved us all entire to a lifetime of online and digital learning, I think we've missed a beat somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I just um I just wrote an article that was about essentially humanizing the workplace and learning experience. And I think you're absolutely right that we're gonna continue using technology, we'll continue engaging in digital spaces, but it will be more hybrid. And I think what the digital opportunity and the accessibility of getting together remotely and being more easily global, I think that will be more purposeful with the kinds of, okay, we could be, I don't think all of us will be because not everybody will think this way, but I think the opportunity is in purposeful that we can use technology and digital collect digital gatherings or digital spaces really purposeful. Um, and then we can also be even more purposeful um, when we gather in person. And so I think the combination of how we do that, and of course it will look different depending on the, the learning experience and the need and the audience and environment, et cetera. But 
I just think that the opportunity is in the hybrid space. And that's what I would love to see. And it truthfully, when I worked at the domestic violence hotline um, years ago, we're talking like six years ago, we did hybrid stuff. It was on, we used online learning and whatever technology we had access to at the time. And then our in-person experiences were very purposeful. They were, they, we could go deeper um, and we could do the really important pieces of learning, which were practicing and role-playing and shadowing and using mentor relationships and accountability and things like that, that human beings need um, to facilitate true learning. And I think the point that you made, I just want to underscore it, that so because of the accessibility of like our online learning spaces have made information more accessible than ever before. And at the same time, we're seeing more people put out more information and it's not all valuable. Um, and information doesn't equate to learning. And I think that I had um, a person in my life who um, I was working along with and you know, there was a, an education model that was really more of a content organization model. And I think many people confuse education with content. And it's yep. something that we really have to move beyond. And in, in the notes that I was making in preparation for today's conversation, I was thinking, you know what, when it comes to learning as a process, and I'd love to know your definition of learning, because I think that's something that is often missed. Um, but I think information or the content piece of learning is really just a small, small segment of the larger learning, just like the technology that we use. Technology isn't going to revolutionize our learning experience in of itself, but how we use the technology and how we use AI and the content and the kinds of methodologies that we build to create a really powerful experience, like literally opportunities are limitless, but none of those things in of themselves are going to be the revolution. They're just part of a larger process that makes something more fun or engaging or different at this current time in our lives. Yeah, I do think that every few years we come up with a term and then that becomes what L&D latches onto and yes. becomes the revolution. And so yes. whether it's technology or whether it's content, uh, for a long time, we became just performance consultants. And uh, now, have you noticed the during the pandemic, we suddenly became mindfulness gurus. Like yeah. somehow we, we became mm -hmm. these empath leaders like it was this this in, this thing that we didn't need to know or have before um courses started coming out on on mm -hmm. on this on on being human it was the most bizarre thing ever so we find these things to attach ourselves to you know micro learning and then and let's make it even more micro and oh there's tiktok so it's really mm -hmm. really micro now mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. without actually thinking is what is the vehicle, what's the content, and what's the outcome? Um, and that outcome base, the thinking of where do I want somebody to get to on a journey mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. I buy anything, before I mm -hmm. build anything, before I sign up to anything, mm -hmm. where is it that the business and the individual need to go on their journey? What is the outcome? What's at the end of it? Because mm -hmm. this also then ties into the impact. So mm -hmm. we now have all of these, you know, and people forget that Kirkpatrick was in the 50s. Um, mm -hmm. We've got, we, everything is tied. Learning measurement becomes learning post-mortem. It becomes mm -hmm. a justification of why we did something. When mm -hmm. if we started right in the beginning and went, why are we doing this? Is this a learning intervention? What are the right. outcomes, both behavioral, right. business um, performance wise and individual behavioral change that we want to affect and work yourself back from there? You'll yeah. spend a lot less time at the end measuring or worse still justifying why right. you created this piece of learning within the pedagogy that you did. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that um, I know we've gone somehow the whole life cycle right to the end yeah, of me yeah. measurement uh, but it, it's more so now when resources are scarce the human interaction is scarce businesses are going to find their way out of this pandemic and you really have to think about how am I supporting this world in its recovery 
this mm-hmm. work world and its recovery? What is my role as a learning person? And mm-hmm. most importantly, just to be disruptive, if I was gone from the organization of the future tomorrow, would anybody notice? Mm. Mm. So there's a couple of things that um, what you said ties really nicely with, um, as I was thinking about what is disruption and specifically what is disruption in the context of learning? I spent time this morning thinking about that and I came to the conclusion that um, true learning is when transformation and behavior change happens. In my mind that the process of learning or learning as a tool is really about causing some sort of positive transformation. And I think that because COVID happened and technology was utilized and and learning and online courses have become so accessible, people are using these terms. When I say people, I mean all kinds of people, whether it's a weight loss program or it's a, um, a wealth building tool or it's um, you know organizational development. There's so many different subject matter experts out there that are putting out courses and they're, they're sharing good information, but many people are using this word results oriented or transformation first. And so you just mm-hmm. talked about like Kirkpatrick and yes, all good learning designers know that we want to work backwards. We want to start with what's the goal, what's the outcome. But what I'm seeing is that people are just people who are not trained and don't really understand learning are coming into the learning space and developing products. So that's a a disruption in of itself. And so I feel like learning experts or people who want to go into learning and make a, a real impact that we have to disrupt the disruption. And for me, what that means is changing the way that people report the results of learning. And so here's an example I saw. It's a great learning product. It's a wealth building product. I'm not going to say the name of it, but, or not wealth building, excuse me, it's a weight loss product. And on their landing page, it's like an eight week course. And it's all about helping people to get in better shape. And they said on there, um, see the results of our program. And so Serena, when you think about results, like what kind of data would you imagine that you would see? I mean, you know, you're on a, a course landing page and it says, we've produced, our, we've produced results. And then it has like four numbers. What numbers do you think you would see there? Just throw some at me. <laughs> well, actual change. So some kind of, so, sorry, I missed you for a second there. You said change. Can you repeat that? Oh, I said actual physical. So if it's a weight, the effectiveness by actual changes in weight, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. So you might see like someone's lost five pounds or they've, they've got, they've lost inches or maybe their percent of body fat has reduced and their percent of body muscle has increased, right? You think that those would be the kinds of results or outcomes that you might see. No, that wasn't what I was seeing. And I, this is the problem that I think is happening is that people are reporting outputs, not outcomes, and they're calling them results. And that is very scary to me. So this particular program was saying we had 100,000 participants and we had 575 five-star reviews of our program. Those are just outputs. Those are just things that people are doing, but that has nothing to do with the actual outcome, let alone the impact. You mentioned impact earlier. I think that outcome data would be the weight loss and any kind of measure. And then the impact of that would be anything from confidence to taking more pictures or spending more time on the beach in my bathing suit or whatever the impact is for why you wanted to lose weight in the first place. And so speaking from disruption, I really want to see learning leaders, especially in the consumer education space. I want to see more people being like, hey, wait a minute, this isn't, this isn't accurate. What you're talking about in these landing pages, these aren't results. Maybe they're business results, but they're not results for your learner or for the audience. And that to me is really scary. I'd like to see us change that. So uh, I was very fortunate um, this last year, I wrote a, a, ch- a chapter for um, um, Brandon Carson's book on, on uh, a digital play, a le- L&D playbook for the digital age and um, on, on impact measurement. And the first thing that I say, and I will still say is um, just stop measuring learning that in pie charts and lovely colorful bar graphs that show you things like consumption 
of mm-hmm. learning butts on seats happy mm-hmm. sheets and how many times how much of time people spent on mm-hmm. your system consuming mm-hmm. the the content that you produced because mm-hmm. that just shows the business how much you took them away from doing their day jobs yep. it shows them the opportunity cost of lnd and it shows them that um you, you that lnd function is busy we did stuff this year look at how much yeah. stuff we did so yeah. and none of those not measures, the right measure <laughs> none of those measures include you know besides being very pretty bar graphs and charts mm-hmm. none of mm-hmm. those measures actually talk about impact how many mm-hmm. lnd people know what the bi tools of the business are how many lnd people use sales forecast and pipelining to mm-hmm. go that was the effectiveness of my training before and after mm-hmm. if you're part of a consultancy or a delivery how do you do you look at utilization has utilization gone up after this amount of technical training mm-hmm. and 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 leadership is is a whole different stream in itself mm-hmm. because you know yeah. billions of dollars spent this year and we don't have anything that independently anything measures the efficacy it. of leadership yeah. training so yeah. let's talk about that or let's call it what it is right it's it's a, a reward for being part of an exclusive club mm-hmm. welcome here's a nice hotel and here's some amazing food and let's network well I don't even that's gone during the pandemic and a lot of right, people, right, companies right. said that they postponed their leadership programs during the pandemic because mm-hmm. it couldn't be face to face which tells you something about these programs in themselves but mm-hmm. um back, back to the measurement a bit there are so many thought leaders right now actually thinking along these lines you know thinking mm-hmm. along like bob moshe's thinking about the moments of when you need something mm-hmm. or thinking about what the transfer effectiveness is of what mm-hmm. it is you're delivering like will paulheimer or ina weinbauer heidel or what mm-hmm. what um the trish Uhl is doing in this space or that there is so much going on in actually thinking about what impact am I having on the productivity Mm -hmm. of the business and contributing to its bottom line because if I'm not then Mm -hmm. everything I'm doing is just pretty pie charts and bar graphs and Mm -hmm. nobody's going to need it in the future you can learn to build I mean I'm I'm exaggerating a little but you could pretty much learn to build a rocket ship on YouTube right it doesn't make Mm -hmm. you more employable doesn't make you more productive so what is it that learning brings that can yes. be measured and transferred into business results. Yeah. And I mean, that's so, where we need to see an mm-hmm. ins- incredible amount of disruption because we still end with happy sheets and butts and seats and happy pie yes. charts. <laughs> yes. And where, where I see, again, the opportunity and also some scary things happening, there's a, this incredible opportunity in consumer learning. And that's the space that I've been in the last year and a half is working with people who have incredible success stories and they basically want to take their life story and their, you know, the failures they've experienced and the successes they've experienced. They want to create a learning opportunity so that other people can learn from their failures and their successes and become successful faster than the thought influencer did themselves. And I think that's wonderful. I love these resources, but the challenge is that these particular learning opportunities, they're not grounded in this measurement that is so important for us to demonstrate the ultimate value of learning as a tool to create transformation. Um, Just like there's lots of other tools that cause transformation, learning is just another one of them, but we have to design them differently. And one thing that I think is really scary is that women are the ones that dominate the learning and development industry. We are the educators. We are the um, learning experience designers. We are the ones getting doctorate degrees in education or some related field. And yet, because the industry doesn't design learning to ultimately show results, then ultimately what we're doing is perpetuating a women-dominated field that is the least paid that's almost in some cases undervalued because we're not designing learning appropriately. So when I think about our conversation in this context of you know, women talking about learning, I think about both the scariness of if we don't make a change, 
And if we don't hold ourselves to a higher standard and push back to leadership or push back to whomever is perpetuating the smiley faces and the beautiful pie charts, then we are the ones that suffer because we're the ones who are going to continue to be underpaid. We're going to be continued to be afraid when the economy goes down because we're going to lose our job because L&D isn't seen as an essential department. And so I think this disruption conversation is essential for the longevity and the, I think you said the word evergreen or sustainability of our industry and all the women who are in service today and in the future. So this is a pretty high stakes conversation that we're talking about here. Yeah, and there's something I want to say. I am very prepared that at the end of this doctorate and research to turn around and say that we are of that the the future of learning is bright the future of the l d professional eh, you know <laughs> i'm not so sure not yeah. in its current form not without serious disruption there's two yes. things you you said there um uh, one one was on on the women dominated field you're absolutely right but then when you go and look at the studies of leaders in learning the mm -hmm. numbers fall very very differently it, and, mm -hmm. and it makes you wonder how is it that at middle and lower to middle management this is a very very woman dominated field and then mm -hmm. somehow when you hit that clo uh, chief mm -hmm. talent officer head of learning bracket the the numbers are skewed and i'm uh, you know one some could be the na natural attrition that's supposedly um attributed to us but i do think that it's also because of how learning is perceived and placed in the organization it's yes. that thing that anybody can do you yes. know work for a big a big consultancy firm oh you know this guy is a few years from retirement what do we do with him fantastic he can lead learning he likes people he's a mm -hmm. people person he's interested mm -hmm. in their development let's have them and that's because as a profession we haven't established what our usp is what mm -hmm. is our skill Mm -hmm. What makes us, do we understand how adults learn? Mm -hmm. Do we understand how they take that learning and convert that into behaviors? Mm -hmm. Do we understand how that behavior then translates into performance? And mm -hmm. do we understand the commercials of the business enough so we know how individual performance translates into business results? And we don't. Most yeah. L and D people, this cycle doesn't seem to be the top of their skill set. They can design, right. develop, deliver, and facilitate. Awesome, you're an L and D. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Another thing you mentioned was around consumer behavior, and one of the big things that I have learned in the last three years that I have brought in very, very strongly into my current role is how L and D need to be marketeers. Mm -hmm. How LD need to take the concepts of marketing and bring it into mm -hmm. what it is they're doing. Mm -hmm. The number of times you hear things like, oh, I didn't know LD did that, or mm -hmm. where do I find that piece of learning again? In fact, if you ask somebody in the organization, where would, if you don't know something, what would you do? I'm telling you, the first thing they would say is, I would Google it. And the second mm -hmm. thing they would say is I'd ask the guy next to me. I don't right. think the LMS yep. cracks the top five. Mm -hmm. I really, or may, maybe maybe if you've got a really good, but it's your marketing campaign. What mm -hmm. LMD does is almost like if a tree falls in the forest and nobody has heard about it, if we build stuff and put it out there and didn't compete for consumer attention or learn how to grab consumer attention to consume Mm -hmm. what it is that we are creating and advocating mm -hmm. then can we cannot blame the um or the, the organization for not being on our journey with us and yeah. i think to understand how consumer behavior relates to consuming learning and what mm -hmm. learning creates is mm -hmm. incredibly important yeah yeah i absolutely agree with you i think that you know, for anyone who's wondering, where do I begin? 
because I think your points are so, so incredibly important to the longevity of our industry and the revolution that I think we all do want to see. Everybody wants to be in a leadership role. And I think the reasons that some of those leadership roles from L&D um, aren't as available is because these connections aren't being made and people don't know how to do that. And so I think, I know you'll have some ideas, but I want to share a couple of like, where can people begin in this process of disruption? How do we take these ideas and move the field forward? I, I think I go back to this higher standard. How do we uplift everybody to that higher standard of the kind of learning we want to see? And I think it starts with understanding the target audience. So you mentioned a consumer. So understanding the consumer, and that could be your employee that you're doing training for, or that could be a consumer that you're doing a product to help them with something, but understanding their, their problem. And, and I think this goes back to disruption. And I did a little research. I'm like, well, I, I have this idea of what disruption is, but what do other people, how are other people defining it? And you know, disruption is a common term in the business world. And we know the common examples of Netflix and how they disrupted Blockbuster. And in some ways, Uber disrupted the taxi industry, although there's arguments about whether it happened officially or not, according to the disruptive um, definition. But the idea is that we need to understand the opportunities that exist to do things in a more innovative way, ultimately in service of our target audience. And that ties back to understanding the problems and pain points at a really specific um, detailed to the root of the problem, not just like a blanket understanding of the problem. So for me, when I design learning opportunities or experiences, I'm always asking the question, why does somebody need to know this? what is this information? What are these, what's the behavior change going to do for them? And understanding like the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, sometimes learning isn't the solution. I think you mentioned the, the author from the, the 12 levers of, of learning transfer. I can never remember how to pronounce her name, but you no, mentioned Bible, her. Heidel, yeah. <laughs> yes, I love that book. And I, I think one of the most important things that she says in it is a nice reminder to us all that learning isn't the right solution for all problems in an organization. And so that's like the starting place for me is like, what's the problem? Why are we investing time um, in developing this learning initiative? Why are we investing people's time in participating participating in the learning initiative. And, and then I think once we understand the problem, we can then go to the result. So we know, well, this is the problem. What result do we want to see that's going to solve that problem? And then the results really just give us the blueprint. Well, we know that we want to see increase in productivity because we're seeing um, too many newbie people in our specific role. And so because, you know, this mismatch of new people and need for productivity, we're going to design our training a certain way. Um, there's all kinds of examples. I'm sure you can think of them, but on a live podcast, you can never think of good ones. Um, but I think the important thing is to tie those two things together. What's the problem? And then what's the result that we would want to see that is the solution to that problem? And then when we can tell those impact stories, that's when L&D becomes incredibly powerful in any space, whether you're a corporate or consumer or higher ed. I'm going to pick up from you there on, on when you talked about uh, two things. So one you said about the role of L&D, you spoke about the target audience and you're absolutely right. We do not start right at, and I know calling it needs analysis is a little old fashioned now, but, mm -hmm. but we do not start right at the beginning and go, is this an L&D problem? When some, is this a skills, a knowledge, a behavior problem that can be fixed with a learning intervention? We don't mm -hmm. ask that. And suddenly, uh, when it comes to us, by the time it's come to somebody's already decided that, of course, sometimes they've even decided the, the audience, the duration, the methodology, uh, and uh, uh, the, the, whether it's, you know, face to face or, or they've decided mm -hmm. all that and they've come to you and then you're the order taker, which is supposed to go away. And if you ask too many challenging conversations, mm -hmm. you've lost their interest. Um, right, right, right. We don't have, we don't spend enough time. And the, uh, the other thing, tied to it is 
the role of L&D in the firm and its relationship with other functions. And mm -hmm. one of the things to note is the build versus buy conversation, mm -hmm. to be aligned to talent acquisition and to HR and therefore to business strategy and workforce planning strategies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is this a skill that we need a longer for a longer term in the organization that we should invest in building amongst our existing workforce or is mm -hmm. this something where we need to recruit therefore the buy element and is this something then how does it fit in with the wider organization and what are these people's skill parts that mm -hmm. we can then help sustain and mm -hmm. we're not have we we're not reaching all of those we, because we tend to historically be reactive mm -hmm. um in in build mode where our audience analysis is just about will this work and will they have enough time to do this mm -hmm. um, rather than is this a learning intervention do i need to create this or is this uh, does there exist something that i can leverage mm -hmm. who am i building for it do is this um even something that we need we should build or should we be accelerating that for the organization and partnering with acquisition to, to buy. And mm -hmm. all of these conversations together give us um, a, a value that's different from what we are portraying of ourselves right now. And that for me yeah. is disruptive. Yeah, I would call everything that you just described, it's the learning strategy. Before, and this is I think what can, a lot of people in different conferences I've spoken at, I hear this really commonly. I read it all the time when I'm learning, you know, absorbing what's happening in the LD world. People are struggling with this order taker um, environment that LD has found itself in. Like, how do we get out of being order takers where somebody else has decided this is the learning strategy? And then you're great with content, you're great with subject matter experts, you know how to design surveys, you can build beautiful downloadable assets and just go build that for us. The thing that we need to see is more learning and development experts saying, actually, no, I'm not going to go build it. Yeah. Because we don't have a strategy. And it's so hard. And I know that people are afraid to lose their jobs and maybe they're afraid to talk back, but I, I ultimately um, did my best to try and push back at my last corporate job. And I said, this isn't the way that we're not as powerful as we could be as this very large education team at a very large corporation. I said, and here's what it could look like to do it differently. And I can, I can understand with people who are like no one in the upper level executive team wants to hear what the L&D strategy ideas are from the L&D experts. And so we have to change that. You're right. It comes back to your placement and your brand. So when LD says we don't have a seat at the table, I'm, you know, as a business owner, I'm thinking, hey, I've seen what you bring to the table. I'm not sure I want you to have that seat either. Because right, what right. our value proposition, what we bring to this table, what we present ourselves as to do, the, the expertise we say that we have, we don't bring that to the forefront. I mean, you don't walk into a, a, a cardiologist office and say, give me open heart surgery. You walk in there and say, this is my problem. And the expert will tell you the way to that solution. Exactly. That's the trusted advisor to use Meister's trust equation. That's the role that we should be playing. We're not yes. the vendors at the bottom of the scale where somebody tells right. you to go and build something and you go yes sir yes sir three bags full sir and and you know how many of those would you like and with fries uh we are those people who are going to sit at the diagnosis level and go yes. as advisors what is it that we can help you with and is this a learning problem that requires a learning intervention and until yes. we have that sort of dialogue I, I'm I'm afraid that we're going to talk ourselves out of a, of a profession in this industry. Yes, and I know Andrew is is asking us very kindly to wrap up, and so I just really want to underscore what you said for anyone who's thinking to myself, "I love L and D." Like this is this is how I think of myself. I love learning. I want to be. I want to make an impact. I also don't want to fear for the loss of my industry or my job. And therefore, I know I need to make an impact. And so if anyone's feeling that way in their role, I think you just you just told us what to do. And that is that we need to be a trusted advisor 
And we need to demonstrate our ability to diagnose the problem. That that's really where learning can, and learning specialists and all of those that have either, I forget the word you use, but either time in the field, and we've learned so much just by being in the field for so long, or we're academically trained or ideally a combination of both, that um, we can be that trusted advisor to provide a strategy such that at the end of the cycle, when we the learning is over and we are looking to results, we know that we were strategic in how we designed something from the very beginning. And so that's the role that all learning anyone in our field should aspire to. And if you're not sure how to do that, every single author, and maybe we can put this in the show notes, but every single author you mentioned earlier, Serena, read those books, understand them and you know, get them to become intuitive strategies for when you're doing that kind of diagnosis and you're trying to figure out the appropriate strategy for the problem or the opportunity that's at hand. And if you don't know how to do that, start there because that's what's going to elevate our entire industry. You're absolutely right. The, the world of industry changing organizations are forming, merging, being acquired and folding at a more rapid rate than ever before. Mm-hmm. And l mm-hmm. has been talking about changing for decades. Every mm-hmm. time I go to a conference, we always have a session on the future of l and it mm-hmm. sounds exactly like the future 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. I think somewhere between the pandemic and the pace at which the world and industry will change. It's right now. And I am seeing businesses which bring us in as professionals a lot later because through my research, I'm also seeing businesses who are actually considering not bringing us in at all. And I have seen alternative models for an L&D function. So if we want to make ourselves relevant to the organization of the future, Mm-hmm. If we're not changing now, it's already too late. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to have to find something else to do after 20 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and if that's not disruption, then I don't know what is. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> An absolute pleasure talking to you, Elena. Thank you so much for this. This was fun. <laughs> this was great. It's so nice to know you. And I hope that we can continue to engage off line and support one another in our various functions absolutely and i'm hoping we haven't scared away andrew's listeners too much (laughs) a healthy dose of reality is never a bad thing as i say so many times i really didn't want to stop this conversation serena and elena unpack so much in this chat that again i'll be coming back to it again to re-listen i've heard it three times already once live and twice in post and still hear new things every time. As always, Serena's and Elena's details are in the show notes, along with some of the most useful links to things that they were talking through. We're really thankful to everyone who puts themselves forward to be a speaker, and we still have some spots available. Some of the most popular topics are filling up, so please do get in touch if you want to be involved, or even just give us your feedback. All the details about how to get in touch with us are in the show notes. Once again, We thank you for listening, and we'll see you again soon. You have been listening to the Women Talking About Learning podcast. Women Talking About Learning is available on all podcast platforms, including Apple and Google Podcasts. You'll also find us on Spotify, Amazon Music, and other music streaming services. Make sure to like and subscribe. It helps more people find us. You can find out more about Women Talking About Learning via our website, womentalkingaboutlearning.com. Make sure you tune in next time for more Women Talking About Learning, for more of the signal and none of the noise.